Whales are the largest animals alive today, and possibly the largest animals to have ever lived. They are freed from the weight constraints that limit the size of terrestrial mammals, as they do not need to support their own body weight. Today we are going to look at a fascinating group of whales known as the baleen whales, which includes the largest of these behemoths. For those interested, there is a document in the description with notable research papers I used for this video, along with the details for the sources of the images used. As you likely already know, whales are mammals, but what are their closest relatives? The answer might surprise you. They are in the order Artiodactyla, so let's have a quick look at it. Artiodactyla contains the even-toed ungulates. This order is sometimes called Cetartiodactyla, combining Artiodactyla with Cetacean to make it clear that the whales are included. The distinguishing feature of this order is that they contain hoof mammals that bear weight on an even number of toes, typically two per foot. Most of them have more toes than this, but these are usually vestigial and so are not used. This distinction contrasts them with the odd-toed ungulates in the order Perissodactyla, which contains the horses, rhinoceroses and tapirs. These bear weight on an odd number of their toes, with horses only having one per foot and rhinos having three. Tapirs are weird, but they do have three toes on their back feet. So, back to Artiodactyla. This is a very simplified phylogeny for the even-toed ungulates. I'm going to go through these very quickly, as it is a group of mammals, and so most people will already be at least somewhat familiar with most of the animals here. The least related of all living artiodactyls are a single family, Camelidae. This includes the camels and llamas, and their closest relatives. The next clade of artiodactyls has the pig-like families. There are two of these, Suidae, or the pigs, and Teosuidae, or the peccaries. If you haven't heard of peccaries before, then they look a lot like pigs, but are from Central and South America. True pigs are from the Old World, that is Europe, Asia and Africa. The next clade is a big one. This is the ruminants, and it has six families. The smaller families here are the giraffes, mustere, pronghorn and the chevrotains. The second largest family are deer, and the largest by far is the bovines. This includes cows, sheep, goats and antelopes. The family that is most closely related to the whales is Hippopotamidae, or the Hippopotamuses, which diverged from whales about 55 million years ago. There are only two species of Hippopotamus, and it might not be that surprising that they are the closest living species to whales, as they are semi-aquatic. They mate and give birth in the water, they go into the water or mud during the day to cool down, and typically only emerge at dusk to feed. Looking at the hippopotamuses likely gives us the best indication of the evolution of the whales, so they are a great segue to start talking about the last branch of Artiodactyla. As you probably expect, given the topic of this video, this is the infraorder Cetacea, containing the whales, dolphins and porpoises. Whales and dolphins are called Cetaceans. As you will realise when we go through their phylogeny, the prefix Cetae is often used for their scientific names as well. The origin of this word can be traced back to Greek mythology, the Greek Ketos, later Latinized as Cetus, was used to refer to any huge sea monster. While often depicted as sea serpents, Cetae were also sometimes shown to have the head of wild boar, which gives it another connection to whales given their placement in the order Artiodactyla alongside the pigs. This makes Cetaceans a very fitting name for the whales. For this reason, the constellation Cetus is sometimes called the whale in English. As I have already said, the hippos give us the best indication for how the ancestors of the whales adapted for a completely aquatic lifestyle. Hippos diverged from the ancestors of whales about 55 million years ago. I will not be able to cover all known whale ancestors here, but I will give a quick overview of some of the key ones to show their progression from terrestrial to aquatic. One of the earliest known ancestors of whales was a small creature in the genus Indohyus. This was a small ungulate about the size of a domestic cat. It is notable for having unusually heavy bones, and furring behaviour from fossils is a difficult science, but one suggestion for this is that it reduced buoyancy in the water, allowing it to dive easier. It was believed to have behaved similarly to the modern water chevrotain, and used this density to dive into water when threatened. Despite looking very different, it is known to be closely related to modern whales due to the structure of its ear bones, which is only seen in modern cetaceans. Another early ancestor of the whales was Pachycetus. While it is believed to have been mostly terrestrial, Pachycetus ate fish and other small mammals, so likely stalked through shallow water. It was wolf-like, both in size and appearance. This is due to convergent evolution, as it was most adapted for running, similar to modern-day wolves. This led to more amphibious crocodile-like animals, the most well-studied of which is likely Ambulocetus. 
Ambulocetus had a narrow, streamlined body, a long, broad snout, and eyes positioned at the top of its head. As I said, it bears some superficial similarities to modern day crocodiles. While it was adapted for mostly aquatic lifestyle, its limbs were strong enough to support its body weight on land, so it was still definitely amphibious. Although it could go on land, it was likely more comfortable in the water, as its feet were adapted more for swimming, resembling that of a modern day otter or seal. They were likely webbed and so were not a true flipper. The next step in whale evolution is likely the family Protocetidae. This was a diverse family of extinct whale ancestors. Their general body plan was believed to have been similar to Ambulocetus, but they get a mention here for being possibly the earliest example of the tail flukes that modern whales are known for. Tail flukes are the name given to the way a whale tail divides into two lobes, instead of being a unified structure as is seen in every other mammalian tail. There is still debate about whether this was a feature of Protocetidae, but if true, it would have helped them swim better and make them more awkward when on land. Whether or not they had flukes, they do still have adaptations to an aquatic lifestyle, such as a nose that is higher in the heads than is seen in other mammals. This feature was a precursor to the blowholes seen in modern cetaceans. They were still amphibious, so they could move on land when required, but would have been much more comfortable in the water. The first fully aquatic whale ancestors are believed to be members of the family Bacillosauridae. Many of these animals appear similar to prehistoric mosasaurs with long serpentine bodies. This is another example of convergent evolution, as the mosasaurs were reptiles and so were not at all related to cetaceans. Members of Bacillosauridae had sharp teeth and powerful jaws, and unlike modern whales still retained hind limbs. The impressive size seen in modern whales was seen here too, with some species possibly reaching upwards of 20 metres or 65 feet long. As you might have noticed from this quick jaunt through whale evolution, there are several distinct phases. The earliest ancestors likely used water to escape from predation like Indohyus, or hunted in the shallows like Pachycetus, but were mostly terrestrial. Then we come to the amphibious ancestors like Ambulocetus and Protocetidae that were well adapted for swimming but likely spent at least some of their time on land. Finally, Bacillosauridae completed the journey from completely terrestrial to completely aquatic, leading to the whales and dolphins that we are familiar with today. So, moving on to the modern whales, what does their phylogeny look like? They are in the infraorder cetacea, along with the dolphins and porpoises. It is impossible to have a phylogeny of all whales without including dolphins and porpoises. But, we will not be looking at all whales today, so we will also not be looking at the dolphins and porpoises, although I would love to talk about them in the future. Cetacea has two parv orders. The first is Odontocetae. This name literally means toothed whale, which is very descriptive, as it comprises all of the whales with teeth, and includes all of the dolphins and porpoises. This is not the group I will be focusing on today, so let's have a look at the other parv order. This is Mr. CT, more commonly known as the baleen whales. This name perfectly highlights the thing that groups these animals together, baleen. Baleen refers to the mechanism these whales use to feed. Instead of teeth, they have plates of baleen in their mouth. Baleen are bristles made from keratin, the same substance as human nails and hair, and these let them use their mouth as an enormous sieve. They open their mouth to suck in large quantities of water. They then press their tongue against the roof of their mouth to force all of the water out, squeezing it through their baleen and out of their mouth. Small organisms like plankton, krills, small fish, crustaceans, and anything else they trapped will be unable to get past the baleen, and so will be left behind to be swallowed. They cannot swallow anything too large, however, as despite their large size, their throat is too narrow for bigger prey. Due to their large size, a single blue whale consumes around 16 tonnes of krill every day, or around 12% of its body weight. Smaller species, like the bowhead whale, consume around 6 tonnes of zooplankton daily. While this seems like a staggering amount of krill and plankton, it appears that the more a whale eats, the more abundant their prey becomes. This is due to nutrient cycling, sometimes known as the trophic feedback loop. Basically, the whale ingests krill and plankton, and then when they defecate, they return those nutrients back to the environment. This increase in nutrients will then cause population booms for these small organisms, subsequently increasing their numbers despite, or perhaps because of, the predation of baleen whales. Just so I don't have to keep repeating it throughout this video, I will briefly cover their main predator here. Most of these whales are too large to have predators, although the young may be attacked by a variety of oceanic hunters if they get the chance. However, the one predator able to take on a full-grown whale is another cetacean, the orca. 
Orcas can work in groups and are highly intelligent, so can take down prey much larger than themselves, including even blue whales, the largest known animal. Having said that, they are only occasionally successful in doing this. There have been at least 20 eyewitness accounts of orcas attacking fin whales, the second largest animal, but only in a couple of cases did this result in the whale dying. The whales did not seem to fight back, instead preferring to flee, but in these cases, the orcas pursued and attacked the whale for over an hour, and sometimes several hours, before the whale eventually succumbed, so this does not seem to be an easy target for them. Still, the orca is the only known predator that is able to kill a full-grown whale. Returning to the phylogeny, we are going to start with the family Balanidae, the right and bowhead whales. There are four species here, although until the 2000s, all of the right whales were considered a single species. As with many phylogenies, genetics has really helped distinguish different species, so now there are known to be three species of right whale, as well as the bowhead whale. These whales are notable for their unusually large head, lack of a dorsal fin, and high blubber content. This latter fact made them a prime target for early whalers, so many of these species were threatened before the moratorium on whaling was enacted in the 1960s. There is also speculation that this is the origin of their name, right whale, that they are the right whale to hunt to make a profit. While a commonly repeated story, I should point out that there are no confirmed sources for where the name came from. It could, more simply, refer to them simply being a true or proper whale. The white patches seen on Balanidae species are actually a type of parasite that lives on whales. In right whales, these parasites live in callosities, which are raised patches of toughened skin on the whale's heads. These parasites and callosities actually play an important role in scientists identifying individual whales, as they can be told apart by the different shapes these parasites make. The bowhead whale, Balaena mysticetus, is the only living representative of its genus. It is found in the waters around eastern Russia, Alaska, Canada, Greenland and northern Iceland. The bowhead whale is the only whale to spend its entire life in the Arctic and subarctic waters, so it has several adaptations to cope with this. The first is its large, triangular-shaped head from which it gets its common name. This head is used to break through the ice so it can surface when it needs to. Secondly, it has the thickest blubber of any animal. Blubber is a layer of fat found in many cold-water, ocean-dwelling animals that insulates them to keep them warm. It has the largest mouth of any animal, which is almost one-third of its entire body. Females are larger and can reach up to 18 metres or 59 feet long. To go with this large mouth, the bowhead whale also has the longest baleen of any whale, at around 3 metres or 10 feet long. The bowhead was a popular target for early whalers, causing a severe reduction in their population until the moratorium against whaling was enacted in 1966. Now the IUCN classifies their global population as least concern, although specific populations are still considered endangered. Despite this moratorium on hunting, the International Whaling Commission does allow subsistence hunting for some native peoples. Due to the cultural significance of the bowhead whale, the Inupiat people of Alaska and the Yupik on St. Lawrence Island are allowed to harvest them with very strict limitations. Since I'm not of either culture, please let me know in the comments if I get any of the details wrong. However, from my understanding, the Inupiat view the bowhead whale hunting as a vital part of their culture and have hunted it for thousands of years. They pray to any whale they kill to give thanks for the life it has given them. Hunters will bring the whale back to the community, where they will take what they need and then gift the rest of the carcass to the entire community so that all may share in its bounty. These whales not only provide food for the community, but also traditionally provide raw materials for tools and other uses. Let us now return to the next species in Balanidae. The North Atlantic right whale, or Eubalaena glacialis, is among the most threatened whale species in the world, being labelled as critically endangered by the IUCN. They are found at the Atlantic Ocean, neighbouring the USA, Canada and Greenland in the west, to Sweden, France, Portugal and Morocco in the east. Despite this being their official distribution, their eastern populations are believed to be functionally extinct, with only a few isolated sightings in the last 30 years, and a population with no more than 20 whales. There are fewer than 370 individuals left in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean, and these are protected by laws in Canada and the United States of America. They reach lengths of 16 metres or 52 feet, and weigh up to 70,000 kilograms or 150,000 pounds. They are believed to live over 70 years, and may live longer than 100 years. They start breeding once they are 8 or 9, and can have one calf every 3 to 4 years. Since hunting is banned, their largest threat is accidental deaths from being hit by ships. They are typically docile, and prefer to stay near the coastlines, 
and feed near the surface of the water. This unfortunately has the side effect of bringing them more into contact with ships, making this a serious issue for the few remaining whales. There has been research suggesting that 1-2 to two whales were killed in this way between 1999-2006, to 2006, which is unsustainable when the global population is to believed to be less than 400. This is especially true since these numbers may be low estimates, given that many incidents are likely to be unreported. To try and prevent this, there have been speed restrictions on vessels in certain areas to try and lessen this danger. I could not find more recent data on fatalities caused by ship strikes, so it is unclear how well this measure is working. The North Pacific right whale, Eubelena japonica, is found in the Northern Pacific Ocean, from Russia and Japan in the west, to Alaska and Canada in the east. There are believed to be only a few hundred of these whales remaining, leading to their endangered classification. Most of these are in the western parts of the range, with no more than 40 individuals found near Alaska and Canada. Physically, it looks so similar to the other two right whale species that it is impossible to tell them apart without genetic analysis. That is, if you don't know the area where it came from. Since all three species inhabit different waters, the most reliable way to tell them apart is to know where they were found. In response to the extensive hunting these whales suffered during the 19th century, they have developed some avoidance behaviours. If they sense a boat approaching, they will hide underwater and swim away to avoid being spotted. It was noted during the 19th century that the more intensive whaling efforts became, the more aggressive these whales became. These apparent changes in behaviour have made them difficult for scientists to study today. From what little is known, they appear to have similar habits to the other species of right whale. The southern right whale, Eubelena australis, inhabits the oceans in the southern hemisphere, neighbouring Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Madagascar, Australia and New Zealand, among other countries. They are by far the most populous of the right whale species, with over 13,000 individuals estimated in 2009. As a result, it is listed as least concerned by the IUCN. The southern right whale is known for its interesting surfacing behaviours. All of the right whales do this to some extent, but it seems to be most frequent in the southern right whale. One of the behaviours that is unique to them is called tail sailing. This is where the whale will remain motionless in the water column, face down, with their tail protruding above the surface of the water. The reason they do this is uncertain, with various suggestions being offered, such as playing or feeding, but this is still a poorly studied phenomenon. Female southern right whales return to the calving grounds where they were born to have their own young. They typically have a calf every three years, but this can vary widely up to around 23 years at the furthest extreme. It is also promising to see that the southern right whale population is increasing. For example, Brindar et al. in 2023 reported that there was an annual 7% increase in their population off the coast of South Africa. Even though they are classed as least concerned, they were still heavily impacted by historic whaling, so this increase is great to see. The southern right whale was the last species in Balanidae, so we can now return to the overall phylogeny of baleen whales. You will see that there is some dispute about which family this branch represents, but there is only one species here, so let's talk about it. The pygmy right whale, Caperia marginata, is more closely related to rorquals like the humpback whale than it is to the right whales, so the name is a little misleading. There is some discussion about which family it belongs to. Fortis and Marx in 2013 determined that it is the only living member of Cetotheridae, which was an ancient family of cetaceans that flourished 5 to 25 million years ago. Other sources listed as the sole member of its own family, Neobelanidae. The pygmy right whale lives in the southern oceans, in the polar waters around Antarctica, and going as far north as New Zealand and southern Argentina, South Africa and Australia. It is rarely seen by humans, so has been little studied. It also managed to escape the whalers that pursued most of the baleen whales. It was seen as of little value to them, due to its smaller size. Adults can reach about 6 metres or 20 feet long, making them much smaller than most of the other baleen whales. Another reason that they were left alone is that they are also harder to find. Part of the reason for this is their relative inactivity. Their blowholes make small and indistinct clouds that are much harder to see than most species. Pygmy right whales are slow swimmers and do not breach the water like some other species, and so are not easy to notice. Due to this, it is believed to be least concerned by the IUCN, but their population size is unknown. Most specimens that are found are those that are washed up on beaches, so many things about these animals and their behaviour in the wild are still unknown. When they are seen in the wild, they may be alone, in small groups of two or three, or alongside other cetaceans like pilot whales, minke whales and dolphins.
Now you will notice that our overall phylogeny has one branch left on it. This is the family Balaenopteridae, more commonly known as the Rorquals. This is the largest family of baleen whales, and I was originally going to cover them in this video too. However, I do want to try and keep these videos between 20 to 30 minutes long, and I will definitely go over that if I do talk about them. So, to do these magnificent animals justice, I will cover them in my next video, and end this one here. However, because I have already scripted and recorded that next video, and because it will technically be a part 2, I will release it next week, instead of waiting 2 weeks like I have been for my other videos. With that explanation out of the way, I do hope you learned something today. Whether about the evolution of the whales moving from land and into the water, or about the rare North Atlantic right whale, or the distinctive bowhead whale, these are fascinating animals, and I hope you will join me next week when we dive into the rock walls. Pun definitely intended. Thank you for listening, and feel free to suggest another group of animals you want to see me cover in the comments.